Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Have you decided to follow Jesus today? Hallelujah. I have decided. Thank you for being with us this morning. And uh, we're going to have the opportunity to ordain uh, Sister Rhonda later. But um, And the Lord just quickened this story to me about Philip the Evangelist. So I just wanted to encourage you because I want to find the pattern for my life and what God has for me to do from the word. Amen. Amen. And so I appreciate the this the Philip the evangelist. He, he did great things. He doesn't, you know, you can kind of have your own idea of what an evangelist does. You can kind of think, okay, he's going to stir up the people or he's going to just give a, you know, altar call, but here clearly in the book of Acts chapter 8 this is the work of Philip the evangelist. They don't call a lot of people the evangelist, but Philip was an evangelist. And so um, I thought it was interesting as I was looking at, at this little pass, this passage in Acts chapter 8, and it's not for my intent to go through the whole chapter, but you can read it at home. Um, he cast out, when he was ministering and preaching, devils got cast out. Amen. So much so that the sorcerer in the same town that Philip was preaching said, I want to use the name. And so he started to use the name, but the devils, <clears throat> he had, did not have Jesus in his heart. And so he couldn't, he, those devils came after him because there was no authenticity to the name of Jesus inside of him. Amen. And so you can see people do things. You can see an anointing on a particular person, but it must be in you first. It must be inside of you. It must, when everything is shaken down, when there's no hair, when there's no, no clothing, when there's no, if you were walking in like the Jews into those concentration camps, you would still have Christ on the inside of you. And that would be that hope of glory. Gosh, I, my mascara is really a mess here. <laughs> oh, well, glory to God. And so, and so <clears throat> we want to preach what God has put in on the inside of us. He's, he has called and determined has for each of us to walk on a pattern for you. He preordained us before we were born, as Pastor Kevin shared earlier off the line. But I want to encourage you that here, even in these situations where Philip was in, where he saw miracles, people cast out, still again, he was led by the Spirit to the Ethiopian, to one person. And I want to encourage you today, it might not be that you're called to thousands, but it might just be that God would send you to one person and you minister the word of God to that person and be faithful as that, that Ethiopian was crying out. I tell you, there are people crying out for God to instruct them in areas and he will send a preacher. He will send an evangelist. He will send someone to minister the word and open up and reveal the scriptures to them so that they can go with it to another nation, to another group group that you Amen. can't go to. And so I want you to get your mind out and get break down what you have been seeing in the natural and seen by TV and seeing all the, and, and get, get, get your mind renewed. Let the spirit of the Lord renew your mind so that you can prove as Romans 12 says, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for you personally. Amen. You are free. Hallelujah. To be all that God called you to do and to be in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 He doesn't make carbon copies. He broke the mold when he created you. Hallelujah. So we're going to ordain. Uh, 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 oh, she's already walking and all these things. Our, our sister today. I tell you, he broke the mold. When he made her. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. We just uh, appreciate the gift assignment of on God for the joy of the Lord that's in her. But the many other things that God's going to unfold as she walks 
in faith and confidence in Jesus. Amen. Just like Philip, he's, he's just being led by the Spirit to the Ethiopian. He didn't know. Hallelujah. He was just following the Holy Spirit. And so I encourage you are free. The sons, the true sons, follow the Spirit, are Amen. led by the Spirit. That's the Son. We don't want to get to heaven. And Jesus said, you didn't, I didn't even know you. Oh, didn't we prophesy? He said, well, no, you didn't follow me. You didn't, yeah, didn't I prophesy? Well, no, because mm -mm. you didn't do what I needed you to do. So, so we just thank you, Father, that we want to be the Philip. We want to we wanna be these people in the Bible that you laid out for us to, as examples that we can live our life and line ourselves up with the lifestyle of these disciples and these, these that did your acts. Amen. And we are still doing your acts. And so, Father, we just thank you for the privilege to lay hands, to, to exhort, and to encourage as, as we're going to do later for, for Sister Rhonda as, as the Lord brings her into this new season where there's a change of raiment. And so, Father, we thank you. We take hold of the changing of our raiment, Lord, for this hour so that we can go in a greater measure of your power and your glory. And we thank you for last season, but we thank you for touching our tongue, for cleansing us, and for giving us a fresh mantle for this hour. And we just thank you, Father, for this place. We thank you that you've given us this place. Worship is in the walls of this place. And Father, we just we just glorify you for all that you've put in our hands, and we give it back to you gratefully in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. Lord. Lord. Well, Hallelujah. God Thank bless you. you. Welcome, Thank welcome, you. welcome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for those that join us online. And it's once again, it's just a privilege to be able to minister to you. It's a privilege to be able to speak the word. Amen. It's a privilege that people want to hear what you have to say. Amen. And the God. <laughs> God bless you. And thanks for joining us today. Anyway, I will try not to go all day. Uh, is it? Oh, okay. Uh, much better. Much better. All righty. All righty. Well, as I pass we on the table, we, we, we were gone here this weekend. We had uh, an opportunity. Unfortunately, our sister, uh, who our sisters who are our intercessors and have been our intercessors for well over 20 years, were unable to come. They, they were... Uh, together they had gone over to the East Coast and they, they got COVID or one of them got COVID over there and uh, the other one, the leader of the pack, thought she got it too. They diagnosed her with the COVID. She took a test and so they diagnosed her with the COVID. So she came down to our house anyway over there and <laughs> came to visit us because we, we were, you know, we thought, well, hey, we, we, our opportunity to see her is so infrequent anyway, you know. So it turned out they did a retest and she didn't really have it anyway. But uh, so we had an opportunity to visit with her over over at, at, uh, uh, on the east coast there, and uh, then uh, they unfortunately because of the COVID and and uh, there were some family illnesses and so forth they had to go on back and they were unable to to uh, join us today. But we will have them again uh, soon. And it's always a special time because they are skilled people at intercessory prayer and skilled at getting a hold of uh, of, of God. Mm -hmm. And you know something Gail said there earlier, and, uh, and, and, and I just want to reiterate that, that, you know, as you, we, we've now, it was 23 years ago that the Lord spoke to us to, to start the ministry. And one of the things that, that should happen to you is that you should gravitate over, if you're ministering or you're in the ministry, you should gravitate over, you should get, uh, I, I'm not sure better is the word, but you should get more comfortable with who you are. You should get more comfortable with your style of ministry, what God has for you to, to minister and, and, and how you do it. And you should, you know, come into more of a direction. And, and you know, like, like for, for, for us, I mean, we do our homework every day, you know. And then when we're going to speak, we'll take a, a, a few minutes and, and uh, we'll actually, you know, seek God concerning the scriptures and what do you want us to say and what do you want. But it rarely ever comes out like that, you know. And so it's, uh, it's uh, normally there's some modification to it before we ever get here. <laughs> but that's okay because we do. We study to show ourselves as an approved servant. 
and, uh, and, we, and we make sure. And the study is not just for the specific purpose of getting to work. And you've got to make sure that if you're going to prosper in the ministry, you don't do that, that you don't study just for the purpose of getting a word that you can deliver to somebody else. You study to get the word for yourself. You study to show yourself an approved workman who understands who's who got the whole word, has got the whole Amen. thing. It's not just about what you're going to deliver to other people, but it's about what gets delivered to you. Amen. And uh, when, when, when we first uh, uh, began, uh, one of the most remarkable things that I would, would happen to, to me is I, I, could, I could tell when it happened, is after a couple minutes of, you know, sometimes two minutes, sometimes three minutes, sometimes five minutes, all of a sudden I'd feel the anointing drop on me, you know? And it's like a blanket, it would just drop over. And, uh, and then um, I didn't feel it anymore, you know. And so I said, God, what, what, what's the deal here? And the Lord said, if I let you feel it, you won't be ministering by faith. And he said, you've got to minister by faith. Amen. So he said, I let you feel it so you could see how it was, how it dropped on you. But he said, I'm not going to continue to do that, you know, because you have to minister by faith. Amen. And it was a great lesson Amen. because, you know, sometimes... You know, <laughs> we have a joke. We you can't look at their faces, you know, because they're, they're, sometimes the faces don't they belie uh, the truth that's actually being delivered, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, so you don't you can't look at their faces, you know. You deliver what God said to to deliver, and it's delivered by faith. By faith, I heard. By faith, I received. By faith, I delivered. Everything we do is by faith. That's who we are. We walk by faith and not by sight. And the just shall live by faith. And the just shall preach by faith. And the just shall speak by faith. And that's how it is with with, uh, uh, Sister Rhonda. We're going to ordain Sister Rhonda today. And uh, she's already been ordained by by, uh, other ministries. And uh, it's just a, a new season in her life. There's a new season. There's a new time. She's, but she's been previously ordained. She's well educated in the things of God. And she's been walked in, in a ministerial functions for many, many years. But it's a new season for her. And, uh, you know, I, I, when, uh, I hadn't been saved very long. A very short period of time. I don't know, maybe I told you guys. And I had a dream from the Lord. And, uh, the, and, and, and in the dream, I met Jesus. And uh, it was in his office. We were in his office. And uh, his office was, it was a big room. There were a lot of desks, you know, and things. And, and uh, people uh, working. There were some people working over here and some people working over there. But there weren't many. You know, there were a few. But there weren't many. And I could tell from the window uh, the, and, the, and the direction of the sun, so it was late afternoon, it was very late, meaning the time is late, you know. And uh, uh, it's late afternoon, and I'm, I'm meeting with Jesus there, and there's a few people working in the room, and he's a, a, a short Jewish man, he's in his 30s, you know, maybe mid-30s, and he's wearing blue jeans and a polo shirt, you know, and tennis shoes, and, and he's seated on the edge of a desk, and we're talking. I have no idea what he said. I mean, not a clue. I didn't, I, I, I have no idea. But what I saw was out of his eyes, love came out of his eyes. It was his eyes emanated this encompassing love, you know. And I, I understood it, it, it's not about what you're preaching. It's about showing the love of God to people. And I'll tell you, I mean, if we're not ministering the love of God to people, then it doesn't matter what you're ministering. None of those things make any difference because the Bible says that first he loved us. That's why he came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should... Whosoever <laughs> should call on him should be saved. Oh, hallelujah. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but through the him the world might be saved. So the idea was he loved us. And first he loved us, and so that's why he sent his people. So the idea of ministry in the beginning is to minister the love of God to people. 
and uh, and it is it is a it is a critical thing. Well, I understood from 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 God that that was that I understood from that dream that whatever call that He had for me, He was calling me to the business place, you know, because we were in His office, and so that I was to be a business person, you know, to minister minister to 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 people, but that I was to be a business person, you know, which is what I was. Uh, at the time, he wasn't changing anything there, you know. It was just to sort of add something to it or take it in a new direction. And that's, the, you know, the anointing that we want to put uh, on, on, on Pastor Rhonda today is that it's not taking anything away, you know. It's not changing who she is. It's adding to. Amen. It's it's going to lay over the top Amen. of who she is and add, add something to her uh, from that, that point forward. Um we're, we're gonna have, we'll have her come up here in just a second. But, um, hallelujah. We, uh, are the, the people that ordained us originally, they were, uh, the line came from T.L. Osborne, is, the, is the, uh, the line, and which is an evangelist line, you know. And uh, Pastor Gail is an evangelist. I, I'm not as much of an evangelist as she is. Uh, I'm more the teacher is more my my anointing I think, but she's she's more the evangelist. But that was the line, and you know what 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 uh, where they got where T. L. Osborne got uh, uh, ordained was uh, there was a small church in the northwest that uh, God had spoken to somebody to start that church and that to go to that church. And they struggled for 20 years, you know, it had never been a, a large church, there just never been many people that come, some would come and some, and he said, uh, you know, he, he would go before the Lord in prayer and say, God, why am I here, you know, what, I mean, we're, we don't think we're, we're being effective, we don't think we're, there's just nobody here, and God told him, he said, there's a person that will be coming that you are to anoint and ordain and to teach, and that person is a person that I've ordained that you would, would come uh, to that place. Well, that person was T.L. Austin. Wow. And um, Thank you, Jesus. they were there for 20 years. It was 20 years before they, they, they ever showed up. But when they showed up, they knew, you know, that it was, uh, this was who it was supposed to be. And they, they, I mean, so, you know, I, I don't know how all of those details play in, but. <laughs> now you know what the details are, anyway. But we 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 have um, we have gone before the Lord because you know you know it was twenty three years ago the Lord spoke to us about or twenty two I guess it was twenty two years ago that the Lord spoke to us about uh, going into the ministry, and through all of those years it didn't look like it hasn't ever looked like what we originally thought that it was going to look like, and but what has happened is. For us, it has brought the most extraordinary satisfaction and the most extraordinary joy, even though it didn't look like what, you know, what, what we thought that it was going to look like. And uh, one of the things God hates is grumbling and complaining. You know, God hates complaining and he hates grumbling. And you can, you know, God, the, 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 the legitimate question of your heart, God's okay with that. You know, but he doesn't like grumbling and complaining. And uh, you get on the wrong side of God real quick with grumbling yeah. and complaining. So, you know, we never grumbled and complained that it looked any that it looked any different. But somewhere along the, the road there, we uh, we we realized, gee, this is better than what I wanted. <laughs> this is a whole lot better than I thought it was ever gonna be. Oh hallelujah. And that's our God. That's a God that we serve. So I, I, you know, we don't know. I don't think we know what God has in store for you, but I can tell you, you're gonna like it. <laughs> it's because that's who He is. You know, that's His, that's His nature. And even people that, even people that that serve in hard places, you know, and things like that, there still ought to be a joy there. If there's not a joy there, you did something wrong. You know. Because there's, there should be a joy there. There should be a, a, a happiness there, you Amen. know. And uh, hallelujah. So anyway, in just a moment, we're going to lay hands on, on this. But I wanted to look at a couple of scriptures. 
The one that I like the best, you know, is uh, Numbers 27, 18. Numbers 27, 18. You know, one of the things, that, while you're looking at that there, you know, we had an opportunity this weekend to minister to uh, a group of ministers that we're connected with. They're Hispanic people. And they broadcast that meeting all over South America. And uh, it was it was extraordinary. There was an extraordinary number of people there. Extraordinary number of nations that were represented there. There were people in the room from, uh, from uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, Venezuela, uh, Mexico, uh, Honduras, um, other places, uh, uh, other places as well. But they were broadcasting to Chile, yes. and to Argentina, right. and yes. Brazil, yes. and the people that they're connected with in those places. You know, awesome. and I thought, my Lord, you know, how did we ever get here? <laughs> how did how, how did we we, we ever get there? When I first got uh, saved. I was going to this little charismatic church, and uh, I had, I, you know, I, my, my parents had taken me to uh, uh, a Presbyterian church, you know, when I, when I was little, and Baptist, and you know, the, the, the denominational churches, and and you know, in the the place where I lived, which was a fairly backward area at the time, spiritually backward area, you know, they made fun of the Pentecostals and talked about them and. and uh, you know, and how, how goofy they were and how ridiculous everything did work. So anyway, I found myself at this little little, little uh, Pentecostal church, you know. It was a wonderful place. It was an extraordinary place. And the presence of God was so there. And they they ministered, the, uh, you know, about the gifts. And, and it was where I was introduced to Pentecostal or the charisma, the, the charisma, the, the gifts. And uh, it was so, so uh, extraordinary. And one day, they had a, a prayer meeting, and we were praying for something. I don't remember what it was, but they had, you know, so the people that were leading the prayer meeting said, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to speak to the north, you know. So they had everybody get together, and we were going to, you know, we spoke to the north, and we spoke to the south, and we spoke to the east, and we spoke to the west, you know, and, and you know, called forth those things that be not. And, those. and I thought to myself, I thought, how did I ever get here, you know, from from there? And that's what I thought this weekend as well. How, how did I ever get here from there, you know? And, uh, you know, God just, God will take me on a ride. And, and it's a good ride. It's, <laughs> it's a really good ride. Anyway, Numbers 27, 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hands upon him. And set him before Eliezer the priest, and henceforth before, and, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put and and we're gonna eliminate the word and, and the King James the word some of thine honor. That's not in the original translation. So in the original translation it says, Thou shalt put thine honor upon him. And all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. And at his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and the children of Israel with him, even all of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua, and he set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him, and he gave him a charge, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So... What, what was happening there was Moses was specifically instructed by God to lay hands upon Joshua, who was going to be a leader. Uh, he ultimately, of course, would become the leader of, of, of Israel, but it doesn't really say that at that point. You know, but it does say that he was to lay hands upon him and take some of the anointing that was upon him and to, to lay, lay hands upon him. And uh, so, so, so that's what he did. And over in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews was talking about 
the, the, I will, I'll, let me read it. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. That word means maturity. Let's go on into maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. What he's talking about there, those six items are called the elementary doctrines of Christ. Mm-hmm. Notice that one of the elementary doctrines of Christ is the laying on of hands. Yeah. Yeah. That there is the communication of something by the laying on of hands. Yeah. We're told that they shall lay hands upon the sick yeah. and they shall recover. Amen. See, that's, a, I mean, that's part of the... Yes. Certainly, if there's an elementary doctrine of Christ, that's one of them. Amen. The laying on of hands for the healing of the sick. Amen. Um, and the Word talks about where Paul did that and where the disciples did that. Amen. And it's a thread that runs throughout the New Testament. The laying Amen. on of hands to heal the sick. Amen. You shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Amen. So it's clear that there is a communication of something via the laying on of hands. At a minimum, there's a communication of the anointing or a communication of the... the uh, uh, um, I'm sorry. In the three realms. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, the reason the laying on... The purpose of the laying on of hands is to do it in all three realms. You see, we are spirit, soul, and body. We consist of all three of those things. And... The laying on of hands Amen. represents the touching of the flesh or the touching in the realm of the Amen. body. You've come into agreement. In other words, we're agreeing in the soulish realm, which is the, the mind, will, and emotions. We've agreed in the soulish realm that, that this is a, a something that we believe that God has yes. and we want to do this and yes. we're going right. to... So we come into agreement. We exercise the law of agreement. But the laying on of hands does it in the physical realm or in the realm of the body and then in the spirit, God touches it and God joins joins in there. So so there's an anointing in all three realms is is what is accomplished by the laying on of hands. Same way with with healing the sick or laying uh, laying hands on. Now, let's look, I want to just look at a couple other verses here. Uh, First, and and, uh, we'll start with 1 Timothy. And 1 Timothy 4, 14. First Timothy 4, 14. And this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to his son, Timothy, or, or his adopted son, or his, his son in the faith. It says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly to him, to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. But neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given to you by the laying on of hands. In other words, something was communicated. What he's saying there is something was communicated by the laying on of hands. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, this is his instruction now. This is an instruction he gives to Timothy. He says, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker of other men's sin. Keep thyself pure. In other words, be careful. You know, be careful about laying hands on people too quickly. To, uh... mm-hmm. Amen. I won't tell you who it was, but somebody was telling me the other day, you know, that it's, he said, uh, I won't tell you what church it was. He said, he said I just got to find a new church to, to go to, you know. He said, uh, he said the anointing, and this is, this is a giant church. And he said, you know, there's so many ministers there. He said, the sole criteria for those guys is not are they anointed, not do they understand the word, but do they wear skinny jeans. <laughs> <laughs> He said, because all of them seem for some reason they all wear skinny jeans, you know. <laughs> and the purpose, of what, what he was saying is, they want to look like the world. That's the deal. They, they want to look like the world. And listen, I charge you, don't look like the world. 
you know, I mean, you do not want to look like the world. And so the, the, one of the functions of the laying on of hands is it's not been done suddenly. It's been done in consideration of all of those things that, you know, that are godly qualities. Um, but, but, and, and we certainly don't do it suddenly. I mean, listen, if there's anybody we've known forever and ever, we've known Rhonda forever and ever, and we, we know that the godly qualities exist in her. And that they are, they dwell richly in her. And it's certainly not suddenly to lay hands upon them. Uh, Rhonda, by any stretch in the imagination. But you know the the uh, the I was meditating this the other night, and uh, and it, it is it is a great passage because you know at the Last Supper, what happens is Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. You know at the Last Supper, and I believe it was Peter says, you know, not my feet, but all of me. Yeah. You know, and and Jesus said, no, you know, you're clean. The rest of you are clean. It's just your feet. You know, just 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 your feet. And I thought, well, what does that mean, you know? It's the place where you touch the earth. It's the place where you touch the world. It's, there's a sin nature that has pervasively come upon the earth and so forth. And what he was saying was, you're clean on the inside, but the place where you touch the earth, you have got to wash that on a regular yes. basis. And I oh, charge yes. you, yes. if you are in the ministry, yes. you have got to wash the places where you touch yes. the world. You know, yes. you've got to be separated from the world. It's not that, I mean, we're not, we, we minister to people in the world. We are, that's who we're charged yes, to be. Yes, that's what yes, we're supposed to do. Yes. But you still have to come away and wash yourself Amen. of that place where you touch the earth, you know. Amen. And Thank you, you repent, yes. You know, you just seek God concerning, you know, wash me. And you do that through worship. Yes. You can do that through praying. And don't you do that through worship? Amen. You know, I'll say this about the, the ministry, and, and I'm continually, I'm continually um, reminded of this. It, it, I, we see it all the time, and it's uh, the the scripture is the First Samuel thirty, and uh, what happens is that uh, well, we can turn that for a minute. Listen, we're not in a hurry. We. <laughs> Uh, you know, we <laughs> probably had a five-hour meeting yesterday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we're used to those long ones. Yes. Hallelujah. Mike was with, Mike was with us. And, and, uh, he, Mike's not used to five hours. But, <laughs> but he was fine. No? That's great. Yeah, there's something about just spending time in the presence of God. That transforms you. You know, there's just it's 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 being in the presence of God to be saturated. You know, just let God's presence yes. just saturate you. Anyway, what's the story here? First Samuel thirty. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burnt it with fire. And had taken the women captive that were therein, and they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burnt with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, uh, whatever their names were, and David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all, every, all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. There's a doctrine there. There's a ministry doctrine Amen. there. That you have got to develop the ability to encourage yourself in the Lord. Because if you think that you can rely on other people in the ministry to do that for you, you are dead wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. We, uh, <laughs> and, and listen, we're probably preaching to the choir here, you know, but we all know that, that, that the reality is that you cannot rely upon other people in the ministry to support you, to help you, to encourage you. To, you just can't do it. What you've got to do is you've got to be able to encourage yourself. You've got to develop that ability. 
And you do it through worship. You do it through praying in tongues. You do it through the study of the scripture. You do it by sitting in the presence of God. You're getting in the presence of God. Meditating the word. Meditating those things in, in the presence of God. But you must develop the ability to encourage yourself in the Lord. Because if nobody else is available, or if there's no situation or circumstances, you still got to be encouraged. Now what happens, and this is a remarkable thing that happens, is that so, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. And David said to Abathar the priest, the Himalayan son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. Now, fascinating that he needs a word. He wants a word from God, and the ephod's how they're going to get the word. But he's got to encourage himself first. There can be times where you are so downtrodden and so that you cannot get a word, you know, because the human natural tendency when you get really, really down is to grumble or complain or moan or groan, you know, and it's just, listen, that's human, it's human nature. And, but God, you know, we're told you come into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So the instruction, there's a protocol to come into the presence of God. And David understood that. In other words, I want to come into the presence of God. I need to get a word from God. But I can't go like this. You know, I've got to build myself up. I've got to encourage myself. I've got to bring my spirit up to the place where it can connect. Think, you know, I think of it like uh, it's, it's, it's what we call the Holy Ghost lift station, you know. Uh, you know, what a lift station, you know what a lift station is? Lift stations, are the purpose of a lift station, and, and, and they're, they're probably unique to Florida, um, it's, they're, they're for picking up wastes, sewage waste and things like that, and picking them up from where they accumulate and getting them into the, the county or the city sewer system, wherever it happens to be. And it's because of our, the, the fact that our land is so low here that when, like in, in your house, if you have a, uh, uh, most houses, and once again, they have to, you have to be connected to a, a municipal system. And so the, the, the waste <laughs> products come out of your house, out of your plumbing, and they accumulate in a tank. And they must be pumped up or lifted up in order to get into the sewer system that belongs to the municipal authorities because those that belong to the municipal authorities they can't put it that low because it can get you know inundated with water or any number of things happen so they put it at a different height but they use a pump to pump it up this is like the holy ghost pump the sewage and the trash and everything accumulates down in the hole of your spirit and you gotta get it up to get it into god's system so god can deal with it you know and then you do that through worship you do that through encouraging yourself or perhaps it's a crude illustration. <laughs> anyway, I always thought of it that way. So David realizes there's a protocol to come in the presence of God. I've got to encourage myself in the Lord. I've got to build myself up. And until I do that, I'm not even capable of getting a word. So I got to, there, there's just something that you've just got to encourage yourself to. You know, that it's one of the, the, of the true keys to the ministry. If you're going to be in the ministry and you're going to do it successfully, you must be able to encourage yourself in the Lord. There's not a lot of those things, you know, but, but that's certainly one. I'm going to tell you another one, as long as, we're on the, as long as we're on those kinds of things, another one is to be a seller. You've got to be a seller. There is, there's no alternative to that, you know, and I'm not talking about giving away all your money or that sort of thing. But I'm talking about being a seller. That's who we are. We're so we sow the word of God. We sow encouragement because there's going to be a time where we need to reap encouragement too. So we sow encouragement. We sow strength. We sow the word of God. We are sowers because if you are not a sower, you won't be a reaper, and you've got to be a reaper. You know, if you're if you sow and you don't reap. Sooner or later, you're not going to sow anymore. Right, right, you're going to stop sowing right, because right. you know. You, what, what's the purpose of doing that if I'm not reaping? Right. You know, and then maybe we'll talk about that here in, uh, in a minute. But the thing about reaping is, it takes so much more faith to reap than it does to sow. To sow is an instant. 
you know, we used that illustration yesterday to Trump because they, they took an offering for the, the ministry there. And the faith required at that offering was nominal. You know, in other words, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of the people they probably put in, you know, something. And uh, but it was probably relatively nominal. Didn't require a lot of faith, and it only required faith in that instant. You know, where they put it in, and they didn't think about it anymore. It was what it was. Reaping doesn't work like that. Reaping comes over time. Reaping. See, there's seed, time, and harvest, and seed is the simple part of it. Reaping is the complex part of it, and time is in the middle there. Yes. So you've got to figure out how you can stand in faith yes. between sowing and reaping, Amen. you know, because your faith's got to be active. You can't have faith waning in there. You can't have faith going away. Your faith has got to remain strong, and it's got to be active in there in order that you would get over to the place where you reap. So it actually takes more faith to reap. Oh, hallelujah. I remember hearing John Amanzini talk about that one time. It's a great word. He was talking about, uh, you know, the, 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 the harvesting process and how much harder it is and how much more expensive it is and how much more required in the harvesting than in the sowing. And we see that in our business. I mean, the most difficult part of our farming business is reaping. You know, it's taking it out of reaping. Yes. It is the most expensive part of the process. It's the one that's the hardest to do. It's the one that takes the most faith. It's the one that I'd rather not do. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. But it is, it, 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 it is what it is. But you'll never get there if you're not a sower first. Amen. So I'm going to be a sower. I'm going to be an educated sower. I'm going to be an instructed sower. I'm Amen. going to know how to do this. Amen. You know? Oh, hallelujah. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Anyway, so back to, did we, let's see, did we read um, 1 Timothy 5? Let's go back there. We did 4. We did 4. Okay, let's, uh, second, uh, let's look at, uh, we, did we do 522? Yes. And let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter one verse six. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. In other words, people can communicate something to you by the laying on of hands. Mm -hmm but you're responsible to stir that up. Amen. I mean, just because it got put there is not going to keep it working. Amen. you got to take it, you got to use it, you got to stir it up, and you got to make sure that that thing works. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Stir up the gift of God. Amen. It may have got in there by the laying on him, but it isn't going to stay that way. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, this is a you know kind of a, a personal side, but but one of the things that helps keep your faith engaged and keep the word active, because that's really what you're doing. If you're encouraging yourself in the Lord, you must keep your faith engaged. And and it's easy to you know you're in the busyness of life. We just don't keep our faith engaged. In the busyness of life, we sort of forget the word. A confession or having some confessions, written confessions that you speak of over the things you're believing for or the things that you do, it keeps your faith engaged. By being able to just, these are my confessions. I, and I, I probably, I'm not sure if I have my word in here. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have pages and pages of confessions of things that God spoke to me or things that I'm believing for. You know, if God gave you a promise, it needs to be in a confession because you need to keep your faith engaged in that promise because you can get a promise of God and not have it come to pass. In fact, that's a very common situation where people got promises and those promises never came to pass. You want that promise. If God gave you a promise, it's sort of like when you were a kid, you know, and your dad said, well, listen, we're going to go get ice cream tonight. You know, you would not let your dad forget that. You know, 
I mean, we're going to get ice cream tonight. You tell your brother and you tell your sister, you know. And you probably even tell the neighbors. And, and hey, Dad, we're going to get ice cream tonight, right? Hey, Mom, Dad said we're going to go get ice cream. It's, it's keeping your faith engaged. That's how you, you keep your faith engaged. And you keep the word before you. The word was, we're going to go get ice cream tonight. So they're not going to say, hey, Dad made a promise, but I forgot what it was. No, no, no. We're going to go get ice cream tonight. We're getting ice cream tonight. You keep, so what you're doing is you're keeping the promise fresh before you. But you're keeping your faith engaged over that promise. And it is critical to the fulfillment. The more supernatural the thing you're believing for, the more you've got to keep your faith engaged. The more it's important Amen. to keep your faith in you, and the more it's important to keep the promise before your eyes, because they can start to, you know, you've all heard us tell the story of, of these friends of ours who, who, uh, you know, and, and make a long story short, you know, the, she, the wife and the husband, they both get the same word. Same time they get the word about where they're supposed to move to. They're supposed to move to another city. And uh, they both get, and they're separate. The girl is there. The husband is here. And God speaks to both of them concurrently, same time, same word. So she comes back there in agreement. There, but but they gotta sell the house, you know. And uh, you know they gotta get a certain amount of money for the house. And they gotta sell the car, and they gotta sell the tractor, and they got you know and the different things and so forth. And and they're having trouble doing that. And pretty soon, I, I think this is what God said. In other words, it moved from this is what God said to. I think this is what God said. Well, I will tell you, they never did it. And today, they don't even remember what God said today. They've completely forgotten what God, and they've gone on about their other lives. How, how different would life have been if they just said, no, God said to move. We're going to move. Amen. You know? And if i got to sew my tractor, I'm going to sew my tractor. If i got to sew my car, I'm going to. You, you, you never want to sell what you can afford to sew. Amen. You know, I mean, because because uh, sometimes oh those things, God. those things that you've taken possession of, there's more involved in sewing that Come thing on. than just the thing. Amen. You know, there's maybe in the tractor, they're sewing the old life. You know, the old life was the farm, and I'm sewing that farm because I'm not going there again. You know, I'm sewing my old life for a new life. And so there can be more in that seed than you ever thought was in there. You know, one of the things that's in a seed is the DNA of the thing that it's going to become. You might not necessarily know what that thing is that it's going to become, but it's a key thing that there's a DNA within that seed. Like a, 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 an acorn, for example. It has the DNA that's going to become an oak tree. Nothing else. It's not going to become anything else. There's a, there's a DNA. There's a picture. You know, and, other, and, and we'll say this about being a sower. The entire created order sows. But only man decides to sow. In other words, the, the, the acorn, the, that tree does not decide to throw those acorns off. They just fall off. Yeah. They fall off by instinct. They fall in the ground. The, the, the acorn doesn't decide to come up. There's the right mixture of water, soil, fertilizer, or whatever it happens to be. That's what makes, the, makes it come up. But it doesn't make a decision to do that. Amen. Only man makes the decision Amen. to sow. Therefore, only man makes the decision to reap. Because... You know, whatsoever man sows, that shall, that shall he reap. So you must, that's why you have to decide to be a sower. I decided to sow. And if you're a sower, you're looking for opportunities Amen. to sow. Absolutely. I'm looking for things. You know, once again, it's not about maxing out my checkbook or right. maxing out my credit cards or, or sowing, a, you know, all the money I've got over here to this thing. It's, God, what do you want me to sow? What, what do I have available? Right. So there's an extraordinary picture in uh, Mark chapter 6. Uh, and it starts at verse 34. Mark chapter 6, verse 34 starts there. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus says to the disciples, he says, you know, they, they, they start telling them that the people are hungry, you know, and the people need food. And, you know, well, what are we going to do about these people that need to eat? And Jesus says, well, you give them something to eat. And they begin to tell, you know, well, listen, we don't have the money. Mm -hmm. If we had the money, there's no store, there's no place to do it. And Jesus says, 
What do you have? What seed do you have? Go and see. Well, he knew they didn't know. They didn't know. You should know what your seed is. You should know what you have available, even if it's prayer. I mean, that's one of the things Pastor Pastor Gail sows prayer. She sows prayer with a whole lot of different people. And that's it's a seed. It's something that she has that's a seed. It doesn't have to be tangible. It doesn't have to be monetary. It might be friendship. It might be uh, it might be the anointing. It might be laying hands on people for different kinds of things. Maybe a direction. Maybe a, a may, maybe one direction. You know, it could be any of the, those different things. But the idea is, see, they didn't know. And their mind was fixed on money. It really wasn't fixed on money. It was fixed on a lack of money, is what it was. In other words, they weren't money-minded. They were no money-minded. Because what they said was, that, you know, gee, this is going to take 200 penny worth, you know. This is going to take 200, whatever. And they didn't have the 200, you know. And even if we had it, where are we going to spend it? Where are we going to buy it? You know, there's a, you know, there's a supply chain shortage out there right now. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, where are you going to get the stuff you're believing for? There's a supply chain shortage out there. Well, and Jesus says to them, what do you have to sell? What, 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 you know, what, what do you have? And the Bible says, and when they knew, meaning they didn't know. They had no idea what was out there, what was possible. So when they knew, they said, well, we got five loaves and two fishes, you know. Jesus never commented on the sufficiency of the seed. He never says, what are we going to do with that? You know? I mean, how are we going to feed all these people out there? There's 20,000 people out here, and you're telling me we got five loaves and two fish, you know? It, we can't possibly... Jesus never comments on the sufficiency of the seed. Because it wasn't the sufficiency of the seed. It was the sufficiency of the faith. It was the amount of faith that was applied to the seed that was available. And I'm telling you, it's a key to the ministry. It is the amount of faith that you apply to the seed that you have available. In the Second Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is talking about an offering. And what he says is, it is acceptable according to what a man has and not what he has not. Well, he doesn't go on to say it, but... What he's saying there, it's acceptable to what you have. But you ought to have faith that you apply to that thing. And so, you know, if you have a lesser seed, you've got to have more faith. you just got to believe it, believe it longer. We've had situations where, we, you know, we, we were working on something. We were so into something, and we just ran out of seed. You know, we just didn't have any more seed. We began to believe God for seed. To believe God for more seed. In other words, God, not, there's a harvest out there. We're believing for the harvest, but that's not it for today. For today, I'm believing for the seed. I just need more seed. I, I, you know, show me the seed. Show me what you have for me to. Uh, show me what you have for me to do. So, Jesus never commented upon the insufficiency of the seed. How much seed they had? How much seed they didn't have? He just took and apply the necessary faith to it, multiply it. And that's where you and I want to go. We want to get to the place, it don't matter how much seed we have, I'm going to put enough faith on it that's necessary. And so, you know, if I'm going to put more faith, maybe i got to pray a little bit harder. Maybe i got to pray a little bit longer. Maybe i got to do something different over it, you know. But it's not the amount of the seed that I have. It's the faith that I apply to that seed. Because according to Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it's acceptable according to what a man has and not what he has not. That's a fascinating passage. And if you were in the ministry, you should get acquainted with that passage and live by that passage. Because one of the things that is happening there is that that he's he what he's telling you is that the anointing is not on the seed. The anointing is on the want to sow. Amen. It's on the want to participate. It's on the want to be part. I want to be part of that. Therefore, I'm going to sow what's available to me to sow. I'm going to sow what I have to sow. I'm not going to have to, you know, I'm not going to go to these extraordinary measures to sow to prove, to prove, uh, 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 to prove my, uh, I don't know, whatever, you know, to, to, to prove anything. I'm, I, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is going to show what i got available. But I'm going to pray over it. I'm going to believe God over it. 
And I'm going to make sure that God knows that I'm willing to do whatever I can do with whatever I have. It'll keep you from getting broke in the ministry, you know. <laughs> oh, hell, and it does have, you know, people get discouraged in the ministry. I mean, that's the truth. They, they get discouraged. They shouldn't, but they do. Because I'll be able to encourage himself in the Lord. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. Anyway, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Stir up the gift of God. Amen. How do you do that? You stay in the Word. You, know, you study the Word. You confess the Word. Your confession Amen. will help you Amen. stir up that Word. Amen. And make a confession. Start with two or three, two or three items. And make sure that you put on there a big thing. Something big, something that, that only God can do, Amen. you know. Because Amen. you want your faith engaged Amen. for big things. You want, your, you want your faith engaged all the time, but you want it engaged for big things Amen. that only God can do. You want God to see, God, I'm believing you. God, I'm working on my faith. God, I'm releasing my faith for this thing that only you can do. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, anyway. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on, Brother Rhonda. Come on, Mike. Thank you guys for joining us. God bless you. And we are, huh? Well, we'll do it. Yeah, why don't you come on and have a seat, Ron, and we'll take the, we'll do the time here. Let my, hallelujah. Oh, Lord, you have been good. You have been faithful to all generations. Oh, Lord, you have been good. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. We bring our tithes and offerings before you today. And I thank you, Lord God, that your word says you open the windows of heaven. That you pour out blessings. We've not run out of the And you have rebuked the devourer. I thank you, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord God. I declare out of my mouth that we are sowers. We are sowers. And by virtue of the fact that we're sowers, we're reapers. Too. Yes. Father, I just thank you. Thank you for instruction in reaping. That you instruct us about thank how we need to Father. reap and, oh, and give us Jesus. clues and indications and directions concerning the reaping. But God, we are sowing in faith. Whatever we sow, we are Amen. sowing in faith. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. thank you so much for joining us. There's a PayPal button on your screen there if you have a, a, a tithe and an offering. And we thank you so much for, for uh, hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today. It's a privilege to be able to come into your home and minister. Thanks again. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 1030. Hallelujah. You want to take some pictures for us, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Is that, is, whose phone is that? This is mine, but I can't. Would you like to use your phone? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you get out an envelope for the offering? And I asked somebody about the envelopes the other day. I'm sorry. Did they give you the certificate yet? No, that's what we Well, we went through all the scriptures and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but once again, you know, we, we, we said that uh, you've certainly been in the ministry for a long time, you know, and you're well educated in the things of God, and you certainly know, you know, mm -hmm. about the ministry. But I believe God's going to give you a new direction, you know, and I think that as we it's still recording here today, we're. It's still recording. Oh, yeah.